Good thing. So I am very honored to introduce our first keynote speaker, Dalma Churchill. So if you have any interest in uh, practical aspects of static analysis, you probably heard of the tool Infer being developed at Facebook, and Peter Hohan and his team was behind it. Uh, Dalma did he, her PhD on type systems at University of Munich, and after that she was involved with the very first startup Peter started, and since she has been helping with uh, scaling up the tool and eventually the company was bought up by uh, Facebook and now it's really scaling up. So today's keynote will be static analysis but applied at really large scale for Facebook applications. So with that, let's welcome Dalma Churchill. Thank you. Um, thanks the organizers for the nice introduction and for inviting me. I'm glad to be here. Um, so I'm Dulma. I'm going to talk about this tool called Infer, Static Analyzer, that we develop at Facebook in London, and also mo used mostly in the large code base of Facebook. And it's also open source, so it's used also by all companies. Um, so Infer is an open source static analyzer. Um, consists of various analysis. Uh, the most interesting feature is that it's interprocedural, so it can find issues across several procedures, across several files. Um, so one of the most sophisticated analysis is a memory safety analysis, where you can find and null point exceptions or memory leaks. And so at the moment it works for Java and C, C++ and Objective-C. So for the rest of the talk, I'm going to talk about um, the architecture of Infer, how it works, and also how we deploy it at Facebook uh, at scale. And also that it's open source and which companies use it. So it consists of many uh, types of bugs, so over 75. So we've been extending the tool at Facebook. Um, so among them, we have node reference that works for all the languages, and memory leaks and resource leaks, and also dead store and retain cycles for Objective C. And so I will give some examples of some of these later on. Um, so a bit of a timeline of Infer. Um, like Shin said in the introduction, this started in a startup uh, called Monoidix. that was based in London. Um, that was founded by Peter O'Haran and Dino Di Stefano and Cristiano Calcagno. Um, so I joined the startup in 2012. And so in 2013, uh, it was acquired by Facebook, and we all went to Facebook and continue working on the tool there. So uh, the main thing we did was uh, apply the tool to the mobile code bases. Uh, first, for the Android apps, because we already had a Java analyzer. So that was in 2014 that we deployed uh, the analysis for Android. and. So then we deployed analysis for iOS apps in 2015. And then we open sourced Infer. This was something we wanted to do. Um, and Facebook was also uh, fine with it. It's been quite successful. And then in 2016, we also added C++ support. And since then, we haven't added any more languages, but we have continued improving the tool in adding more checks and improving the, the existing checks. Um, we are about 12 engineers in general now, uh, working on all this. Um, so I'm going to present a bit about the infra architecture. So the input to the analyzer is uh, a project that we want to analyze. It consists of source code and a build system. So like um, some way of building this project, this is important. So in a 
general scheme, uh, we have front ends and a back end. So in the front end, we take the compilation commands and the source code and we translate it into an intermediate language called SIL. That just like the compilers, it abstracts away from the features of the original language into common features. And um, so it's like an assembly type language. So then the analysis happens on this intermediate language. And there are some differences for the different languages, but in general, it can, th there is one analysis that just happens on the intermediate language that can be applied to different source languages with some differences. And so in the back end, what we do is we, we perform the analysis of the translated methods. Um, so we try to uh, prove that the methods don't have any uh, unwanted behavior. And when the proof doesn't work, then we have some heuristics to figure out if this is because of a probable bug that we should report to users, or because of the, the proof system is not strong enough, or there's some error in the system. And, and so we decide what to report. So that's in, in general how it works. So uh, now specific about the front end part. So at the moment we have two front ends, one for Java and one for the Clang compiler. Um, with this, we can analyze uh, C, C++, and Objective-C languages. So we can also add more front ends because of how the architecture works. Uh, but this is kind of building a compiler, so it is a complex process. So this is the ones we have now. We also need to build, sys build system integrations to um, get the compilation commands from the build system into uh, the infra tool. So we capture these commands. And so we have the source files and the compilation commands. And then we process from there. So in the case of Java, uh, Java C creates Java bytecode. And so we use the Java bytecode as input to our translation into SIL and then continue to the backend. And in the case of Clang, we use a plugin for Clang. So that gives us the abstract syntax tree of the, of the uh, source files that is our input for the translation into SIL for C, C++, and Objective-C languages. And moreover, we have linters. Um, these are syntactic checks that happen directly on the AST of the programs. Uh, don't require very complex interprocedural analysis. Um, so it's basically traversing this AST and finding out syntactic issues about the program. But this is also quite useful. And so we report them directly. So this is generally how the front end part works. Um, and so next I'm going to talk a bit about the back end part for the interprocedural analysis. And so how we manage to scale it. And so the main features that the tool has that uh, makes it scalable, are the fact that it's modular and compositional. So this means that we analyze one procedure with the dependencies at the time. And we, when we analyze one procedure, we compute a summary for this procedure. And the summary can be used in all the calling contexts. So in particular, we never have a global view of the program. And we never need to reanalyze a procedure in a new context. So it is important to have a scalable incremental tools that are easy to extend for, for what we do. And why? Because it needs to be scalable because we have very, very big code bases, like millions of lines of code. But also, it should be incremental because we have hundreds of thousands of commits per week. And so this is important because, as I'm going to explain more later, the way we analyze the code 
is ideally in each commit, so that we give the the input to the developers about some possible issues found in the code very early, as early as possible, when they are still developing the code. So they're still fresh in their minds. And we have more chances that they can fix it quickly. So we need to have a tool that can be um, run, not just for the whole code base all the time, but only for changed code based on, on previous analysis. We also need it to be easy to extend because uh, we're just a small team of analysis experts and we have many issues um, that we would like to tackle in all these languages. Java and C++ and Objective-C have many flaws, and many unsafe behaviors that, that we can tackle with static analysis. Um, so why uh, comp modular and compositional matters? to achieve these things. Um, so being modular <coughs> means that the analysis is actually linear in a number of procedures. Uh, we never have to analyze all together the whole program. That, that would be very unfeasible for a very large code base. And incremental, because when we have modular and compositional, as I'm going to explain in a bit, it is easy to transition. From, from scratch analysis to an analysis of just a diff or a code change. So this makes it incremental. And also for new analysis, we just need to add a domain and transfer functions. And so this makes it extensible as well. And we can reuse the front end, we can reuse the general um, structure of how the back end works. It's just the the part about how the, the composition happens and how the analysis happens that needs to be extended to other analysis. So in general, uh, we do this bottom-up modular uh, compositional analysis. We compute the call graph, do topological sort, and then we analyze each procedure uh, bottom-up using reverse post order scheduling. And if there are cycles, we break them by iterating to the fixed point. Um, so in reality, what we do is something that's not quite this, but it's basically the same, uh, which is we call on-demand analysis. We start with the procedure. And then on the fly, we figure out what are the colleagues, and then analyze the colleagues, if it's necessary. Or if there's already a summary for them, then we don't need to. So. What are the constraints for this? So well, we do have constraints. So it's, we cannot have the same um, properties as if we had a global analysis. So let's say we want to uh, analyze P4 in this example. So um, we will need the summary for the colleague P6, or we can compute it. But we don't know anything about the colors. In general, the summary that we compute for P4 will need to be using any calling context. And so there are, each, there are things that we cannot do, like ask um, in which calling context uh, is this method going to crash. The summary needs to be general, that then when you call it, you can see, depending on the calling context, if it will crash or not. So uh, when we have this, a modular and compositional analysis, then we can make it incremental in an easy way. Because each summary is a function of its instructions and the summaries of the colleagues. So when we have uh, a code change, we just need a simple change propagation algorithm over the call graph to perform the analysis. And so we can have a cache to store the summary is already computed for previous version of the code. And in fact, build systems often work like this, incremental build systems that have cache. Uh, for example, at Facebook, we use one called Buck. And so we can reuse the cache of the build system for this because it, it works in a similar way. 
Um, so, again, how this works. From scratch analysis would be going bottom up and computing the summaries for everything. And reporting all the bugs found. And the incremental analysis would be when we have a change, say in P2 and P3 here, we reanalyze P2 and P3. And then if P3 changes, uh, if the spec change, then we need to reanalyze P1. And if P1 or P2 spec changes, then we need to reanalyze P main. Um, but there is also the possibility of doing incremental analysis where we only care about the change code because that is what we report to the developers. And in that case, we can reanalyze P2 and P3 and stop there because then we will only be reporting to the developer things in the code that they changed and not in the new errors that could have been introduced in the colors. Um, so that's, that's that part. So now I will show a couple of more concrete examples of how uh, all this works to find issues. So first example will be a null pointer exception in Java. It's just a very simple example that shows um, just how it works. So let's see this class, it's a Java class that has two methods, compute something and do stuff. So compute something has a parameter flag and it says if the flag is true, then return null, otherwise return the string something. And then when we call this method in the method do stuff, we call it with a flag true, and then we try to compute the length of the string return. And so we can see that it will return null and this will be a crash. And so the way the analysis works is that we compute pre and post conditions for compute something in this case. And so basically the, that there will be two specifications. One precondition will be flag is false and the post condition according will be return something. And the other one will be that flag is true and the post condition will be return null. And so when we call this, um, we know what are the specifications. And so we know we are calling it with true. So the specification that applies in this case is the one that says when the flag is true. And the post condition says it will return null. So we take this and continue our execution with assuming S is null in this case. And then next uh, step, uh, we'd like to do the reference S in calling S the length and this will cause a crash. And so infer reports um, some error saying something like the object return by compute something true could be null and it's the reference at this line. Uh, it also shows a trace um, showing the, the path that it took inside compute something to, to achieve this. Um, so another example. This is something that I am currently working on uh, for Objective-C retain cycles detection. So just going to explain a bit what, it, what this is about. So in Objective-C, the memory management is not based on garbage collection like in other languages. It's based on retain count. So when pointers point to some objects strongly, the object's retain count is increased. And it is decreased again when the pointer stop pointing to them. And so when the retain count reaches zero, this is when the object gets released automatically. And so there is also weak pointers where the object does, the retain count doesn't get increased when, when you have a weak pointer pointed to it. Um, but when two or more objects retain each other strongly, then there is the cycle, and the retain count never goes down to zero. 
and this means this memory never gets deallocated and there's a memory leak. And so this is uh, still the big problem in iOS apps, finding these leaks. And so we have some analysis to find it. So this is an example of um, some Objective-C code that causes a retain cycle. So here we have one class, my custom view, that has a property delegate. Um, this is like a field in Java. And so then we have another class, my custom view controller, that has a property view. And in the method load view, we create a new my custom view object, and we assign it to uh, the view property of the current class. And then we create the cycle by saying my view. Um, we we set the delegate of my view to be in self. So then we have the cycle self my view delegate self again. So we can see the cycle better in the graph. So we have the object my custom view with the property delegate that is pointing to the object my custom view controller and back. So this kind of thing is common in iOS apps. And generally the solution is that the delegate properties should be weak to avoid this kind of strong cycles. And yeah, we have a checker in infer that finds this. So it figures out that these objects are um, in a cycle. And so it tells you like object of which class, which, which field, and where was it assigned. And also a trace of how it got there. So as I said, in this case, the solution could be making the delegate a weak pointer, and then if I wouldn't find it anymore. Um, so a bit about how this works. We perform um, a symbolic execution of the program. So this is basically the same analysis as the analysis for finding null pointer exceptions. We perform this uh, analysis of memory safety tracking to figuring out where the pointers are pointing to. So basically, we keep a data structure that represents the heap. And so we know which objects are allocated at which time, and what is the relationships between them. And then, so we have this data structure. So it's a matter of finding a cycle in the data structure. And then we also need to check that the pointers are strong and not weak. So this is how we do it. Um, so then I'm going to speak about deployment of Infer at Facebook. So first, a bit of background about how deployment at Facebook works in general. So we have this thing called continuous deployment, where the code gets released very quickly. So we have thousands of developers and like over 2 billion users. And so the code gets released to the users very quickly. In case of mobile apps, it gets released every two weeks. In case of the web applications, like every day. So basically, as you can imagine, manual processes don't work because we wouldn't have time to spend a lot of time testing the code. And so these things don't scale. So Facebook puts a lot of emphasis in automation for this. Um, so in fact, there's like 10% of engineers uh, at Facebook that work on automation. So people like in my team, in static analysis, but also there are many people working on testing frameworks and various other types of tools for helping with this. So there is, in general, this trade-off of we want the code to be correct. When it gets released into uh, the apps, it should have as few bugs as possible. But also, we have a very large code base, which means the developers find it difficult 
to not introduce box accidentally because they lack the whole uh, picture of the code. So especially we have issues with null pointer exceptions because, well, that's an inherent problem of these kind of languages. And you need invariance in your head about which variables are supposed to be null or which ones are not. And this is difficult to keep in track um, for such large code base. So Infa helps with this null pointer exception checker. Uh, but also lately we have been working on trying to add annotations as much as possible. And we have also a type checker for checking these nullable annotations as part of Infer. So especially for Java, developers are now more happy to write nullable annotations. And so it's like enhancing Java's type system to keep track of what is nullable and what is not. And that, that works quite well. Um, so anyway, and developers want to also move fast. Oh, this is um, what we want. We don't want them to spend a long time testing the code. So this is generally why we invest the loading automation to make this simpler. So we have continuous integration systems where the code goes when, when new code is being developed and various tools until it gets released. So we have uh, tests and static analysis at various stages of the way, starting at the developer's computer when they are particularly fast. Something like linters uh, or unit tests, they can run locally. And so they can find some issues before they submit their code. But not so many of these tools can run locally. But they submit the code to a continuous integration system called Suncastle. And there, then there are more tests and tools that run. And so we have a, a tool called Fabricator for code review. So when the developers have uh, written code, they submit it to uh, Fabricator. There's like a, a web interface that shows the difference in code. And they ask the peers to review the code. So every code needs to be reviewed and accepted by people as well before it gets committed. So the code reviewers look at the code and also the tools give feedback on the code. And when the, the tools and the reviewers are happy with the code, this code gets then committed to in, into another CI system called Lancastle. And then even more tools run on it that are even slower that we don't want to do it in the iteration of development, but that still run before the codes get released. And then finally, um, the codes get into production. Um, so Infa works in this CI system. So when the code gets submitted to a CI system, it also gets sent to Infer that runs in the cloud with the other tools. So the code reviewers submit their comments and also Infer, if it finds some issues, submit um, what it finds. And so this is how it looks like. So this will be how some new code will look like as introduced in Fabricator, and then in fact reports this uh, message saying there could be an null pointer exception here. The object S last assigned on line 12 could be null, and it's the reference at line 13. And there is also a trace where they can have more information about it. And so, in particular, we only show issues that were introduced by the diff and also that are only in the file changed by the diff. And so we do this because we find this is the most uh, valuable way of giving feedback to developers. So this is code that they just re written, so it's fresh in the heads. And if there's some issue, they can fix it quickly as part of the iteration of that diff. However, if we find some issue in the same file, but in other part, that it was written a long time ago and not by them, then it's harder for them to know what is going on with this 
code. And also, it, it wouldn't be fixing this, would be something separated from the diff that to write. So there is this uh, uh, philosophy of Facebook that the diffs should be small and should be just about one thing. And so we'd like to focus on just reporting on the things that they just changed. And so this has been quite successful for us. And we have quite high fixed rate compared to all the static analysis. So in the current status is that inference on all the diffs for Android and iOS apps, um, for Facebook, Messenger, Instagram, WhatsApp, and also backend services that are mostly written in C++. So we have tens of thousands of diffs analyzed per month, and many issues reported, and like thousands of issues fixed. And the fixed rate is about 60%. And so this is basically what we take into account as a measure for success. Um, we don't focus so much in trying to figure out if we have many false positives. Um, in general, if we have many false positives, people are not going to fix the issues. So we, we uh, focus on the fact that there is a high fixed rate or, or not very low fixed rate. Uh, to know that the analysis is doing well and is bringing value. So let's go back to this um, general graphic about the CI systems. So I want to talk briefly about this other tool called Sapiens that is a testing tool that also runs in CI that interacts with Infer in an interesting way. Um, so Sapiens is a search-based software testing tool. Uh, there was a, a keynote at ICST in 2015 about it by Mark Harman, that is the main um, developer of this tool. It's currently managing the team at Facebook. And so the tool designs tests, end-to-end -end tests that report crashes. Um, and currently has also a very good fixed rate, about 75%. Um, so very briefly, what the tool is, is like a sweet spot between random and clever design of tests. If, if you think that here is a random fossa that is fast, but doesn't design very clever tests, on the other side is a human that designs clever tests but it's slow designing them, and also not that good at edge cases. Uh, then Sapiens is somewhere in between, because it uses uh, this search to try to find good tests. And so they have managed Facebook scale as well, using emulators uh, that run, and then report on the diffs when they find some crash. So this is how it looks in some data center. They have all these emulators running the tests of the apps. So say finding uh, various paths in how the app could be used and trying to figure out if it crashes. And if they do find a crash, then they report it back. And so basically, uh, inference happens are uh, very different types of tools, but they have a similar aim of finding crashes. And sometimes they find the same crash. So it's quite interesting when this happens, that then they both comment in Fabricator. And if they agree on the same crash, then this is a big signal boost. So developers will fix it with like 100% fixed rate, because it's very improbable that it would be wrong. Um, uh, so finally, I wanted to uh, mention again that Infer is open source. So if some of you are interested to uh, play around with it, it's available in GitHub. Um, so you can download it or report issues. So it's been quite well used. It has over 8,000 stars so far. We also have a website. 
fbinfo.com, where we have documentation about the different analysis and how to use the tool. And so in Mac computers, it's very easy to install it because there's a blue formula for it. Just, you can just do blue install infer. So there are also various companies using infer since it was open sourced, um, like Amazon uh, Web Services, Mozilla, Uber, Spotify. Um, yeah. And so to sum up, um, infer is a static analysis tool that is scalable and incremental compositional, and this allows it to scale, to Facebook scale, and bring value to programmers. Thank you. Am I? For a very interesting talk, uh, I'm going to open it to audiences for questions. Yes. Uh, do we have anyone to help with microphones? One thing I was a little confused about was uh, the nature of how you're presenting the faults to users during code review. So one of the things you said was, if I have a low-level library that's called by other people, and I change it, I could introduce a bug, say, in the interface. You stop the analysis there because it's not part of that code submission because the callers who may be exposed to this new problem aren't part of the, the submission that you're submitting. Well, then later on, somebody goes to change the caller, and when is the problem that was introduced by the person who changed the callee reported to them, right? So it wasn't reported to the developer who changed the callee, maybe incorrectly, and it doesn't seem right to report it to the user who's now changing the caller, so I'm wondering when it get, does it get reported. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so we do it this way because of scalability issues. Like we cannot run in every diff the analysis of the whole app, say, including all the colors of the call change and report this. Also, we have found that the users of the library um, at the moment when they are changing the code are not necessarily going to, to fix it. And at the moment, this is all we have. Like we're not reporting everything. But we are already working on running the tool uh, more in batch mode, um, like every day, to, to tackle all these issues that don't get handled in the diffs. And then, so we would have a list of issues, and we would then create tasks and try to assign it to a right person. But this is just um, because of the scale of Facebook, many tools are doing this. And so developers are like overwhelmed with many tasks about things to fix. So that will work, but it won't work as well as the, the reporting in the diff. But yeah, you're right, and we are working on this. Okay, anyone else? Yes. Very nice talk. Thanks. Uh, so you mentioned the, the uh, integration of Sapiens with Infer. Um, do you, is there inter any integration with your normal testing process? Uh, for example, if you've already run tests that exercise the, the paths in question and there hasn't been an exception triggered, uh, you would know presumably, they, you know, there's not a null pointer problem. Right, so at the moment there isn't any other integration, but we are also working on expanding these integrations. So now we have a, a, a different team structure where our manager is also the manager of Sapiens and other end-to-end -end testing tools, and we are working on building signals in diffs that are more combined when, when the one tool finds the same thing as the other tool to give more joint feedback.
So, in my experience, one of the main difficulties of making uh, the analysis incremental uh, is uh, pointer analysis because uh, um, the, the use of pointers within a procedure might depend on the calling context that uh, introduces a given set of pointer relations. So, how did you manage pointer analysis and how did you manage to make uh, the overall analysis incremental even if you have pointers? Because, I mean, in C and C++ you do have them. Yeah, so, so there are some limitations. So the, the summary for a, a, a procedure will only speak about the procedure and the colleagues and also needs to be very general that um, it will be correct for all the colors. And this generally works for us. For example, if uh, we have that a precondition for a procedure is that some object needs to be allocated with some fields that will be accessed. Then that is in just in the precondition. And then if the callers call it in the wrong way, then that is when we report an issue, when, when we look at the interaction between the callers and, and the summary. OK, next question. Oh, yes. So nice talk. Uh, you, you showed a really interesting uh, sort of flowchart where a developer introduces a code change, it goes to some tools, the tools do some analysis, and then you also have a code review. And I guess this code review is done by, by normal people. So this, to me, is, looks like a feedback loop, and I'm wondering what are the bottlenecks in this feedback loop? Is it the tools, are they slow, or is it the human factor, the colleagues doing the code review? Um, we notice that it depends. So infer itself, even though it's incremental, is not particularly fast. Um, so it can happen that the reviewers are very fast when the code change is simple. And they just review and accept the tool quickly. And so there is some feedback of tools that don't block them, like infer doesn't block them, because there could be false positives. So in that case, infer doesn't get to report at all and they just continue. And something like the, the build, the, the code not building, that is more blocking, they cannot commit if the code doesn't build. So the different heuristics, because we also don't want the tools to stop the developers because the tool is wrong or the, the tool has some issues. And that they, it can be that the developers take hours or days to review, depending on how complex is the code change, and then the tools have plenty of time to to do all the work and, and report. So I'm also wondering if you have this human factor where you get to beat your colleagues with a stick to force them to do the code review, or are they just doing the code review because they love it? Or uh, It is part of work. Like You need to do code review as a nice colleague. <laughs> like uh, In general, uh, in a team, people send the code to the peers mm. and to each other. And yeah, it's part of the work that you do a bit of code review and a bit of coding yourself. Okay, thanks. Okay, I'm going to sneak in one of my questions. So this has been going on for a while now within Facebook, the integration into CI uh, process. So are you collecting any data about the, the, the trends in developer acceptance? For example, are they, is there any chance that they are getting desensitized now or are they fully embracing it? How, what, what do you think? Um, I think in general, it gets better over time. We notice when we introduce a new check that after a while, they start fixing it more because they get more used to if I keep reporting the issues. And maybe at the beginning, they, wasn't very, they weren't very sure about what is this about, or why should I fix it? But then later, they get more used to it. And then there is the issue of many issues being fixed and the code getting cleaner. So in particular, with no point exception, so as I mentioned, we're now also moving into trying to get the code as annotated as possible. And so hopefully we are moving towards a day when the code is annotated and it's just type safety to keep it null free. And, and so we are in this process. And so eventually maybe the, the issues we find go down because the code gets more clean. Okay, 
Uh, I'll give it to Robert. Yes, thank you. Very interesting talk. Um, so, so I was interested. So you have these like two steps in this flow, and where uh, analysis or other tools are, are active. One is before or during code review, and one is before commit. Right. So, so how do you decide? Are the, are, are the same tools active, but they use different analyses in these different steps, or how yeah. do you decide where a certain tool, a new tool, say, or a new analysis would go? Um, so it is about speed, basically. So infer the moment doesn't run locally, even though we have linters, the linters are still not that are much faster than the other analysis, but still not that fast. So it still runs in the CI. So the other linters are not based on infer; they are just basically code, regex, and search. So it's very quick. Uh, you don't need to compile or get the AST. It's just looking at the syntax. And so these linters are run locally because they're long in milliseconds. And they're integrated into the IDEs. So the, the unit tests are another type of thing that are very fast because it's just running a small piece of code. But something like end-to-end -end tests need to run in emulators and need to set up environments and databases and things like that. So it's not feasible to run locally. So it is mostly based on uh, the speed. So locally, we don't want to to block the analysis, uh, the the development. So if it takes a bit long, then we don't run it locally. We wait until they are in the CI process. And for the tools that block the commit, if they are a bit slow, well, the developers need to wait for it. And for all the tools like Infer, well, maybe they don't wait for it. But we try to have a good trade-off that. We do report the most diffs. So, so it, but it's mainly about the time for the analysis. I mean, yeah. so if any analysis that is quick, you, you would like to run it as early as possible. Basically. Yeah. Okay. I see. Any more questions? Yeah. I'll <laughs> okay. I'll, let's start here. I can do. Some, I can do some running now, Shen, <laughs> if you want. What about bugs in infer itself? I'm sure when you implement a new analysis, there must be bugs initially, and every now and then, no doubt, one of them makes it into the hands of developers. What happens then? Um, yeah, uh, definitely. <laughs> so the main thing that we'd like is that we don't have an analysis that just spams developers, that just gives a lot of issues that are all false. So one of the main things we do when we introduce new analysis is make sure that the the fixed rate and the false positive rate is not very high. And when you start, it will be high. So, For example, I am now working on retained cycle detection, and the tool doesn't figure out when the pointers are weak in some cases uh, because of the infrastructure. And then that is one of the things I've spent a lot of time with, just fixing the tool iteratively when I find more and more examples where it doesn't find the weak pointers and I make sure that I fix it as quickly as possible and get to a stable state where the, the trade the, the trade off between good bugs and bad bugs is not too high. Otherwise, we just don't turn it on or turn it off again. Uh, thank you, very nice talk, very interesting. Um, you talked about using two different tools in combination mostly to prioritize uh, defects reported by both of them. Have you looked into complementarity? So how much additional defects can you find by using two tools instead of one? Instead of just one of them? So are there defects that only one of them can, uh, finds the other doesn't report? Um, I mean, we do use all of the tools at the same time in the CI. So there will be end-to-end -end testing running, there will be sapiens running, there will be infer, the linters, and they will all report when they find something. Um, in the case of sapiens, we have actually like worked together to provide some like join signal where it's clear to developers that we both found the same thing and it's a very boosted signal. Um, but we don't decide to turn on this tool or that tool based on whether the other one may do it. 
especially between testing and static analysis, they are very different things. So we generally run both. So in case of static analysis, for example, if they are exactly the same, maybe it's no much point. You're wasting capacity in, in running both. But so we have um, also some checkers from the Clank static analyzer that also run and often reports the same as infer, but often not. And so it's, it's useful anyway to have the two signals. Great. Uh, John over there, right? Running. Um, the other thing you mentioned during your talk was um, extensibility. And I was wondering how frequently people outside of your team have, like in other parts of Facebook, have added static checks to check for things that they're interested in finding. Yeah, that's an interesting question. So we built the Lintas framework for that purpose uh, because often we were asked to do checks that don't require the whole computational power of infer of interprocedural box. Um, especially in Objective C, um, is a very weakly typed language. So there are many issues that I just they just need better types, and and just checks that um, simple in the syntax can be done. So we were doing them ourselves, and then we de designed some framework. It's like a DSL for writing linters, and it's relatively simple to write uh, linked us with this, and the developers have written a few of them, and we just give them support and guidance, uh, but they write them themselves. And in general, with all the Linta frameworks that are Facebook, it's, it's mostly based on developers writing them themselves, because it's simple enough. Uh, with checks inside the infer, I think it's a bit more difficult. We also have a framework that is like abstract interpretation framework, where you just need to define a domain and the transfer functions. So it's relatively easy to write a new check there. But to make an interprocedural procedure check that doesn't have false positives, et cetera, uh, it is a bit more complex. Uh, I, don't, I don't think many developers have done that. OK. Other questions? So I'll sneak in a, another one then. Um, I'm interested in, in uptake uh, and uh, what do you think, what's the most critical criteria for, let's say, a new analysis or even a new tool to be accepted by the developers? Is it, are they kind of agnostic? They don't even know what kind of tools are run and it's more about like how you present it or do you try also to like develop, the, you know, to teach, educate the, the developers about the different analyses and tools that you... Um, so often the way we decide what to work on is based on the need of the company. So developers individually may not all know that this is a big problem, but most of them do know. Like, I don't know, cycles is a big problem for iOS. Not point exceptions are a big problem. Um, so for C++, we are developing now an analysis that is trying to, to figure out the, the life of the objects uh, for leaks and use after free and, and things like that. There are also big problems. So often they come to us with, we have these big problems. Uh, can you write an analysis for it? And then when the analysis reports, the, the reports are uh, hopefully clear enough that they know how to handle it. And hopefully they don't have many false positives. In those cases, they are fine with fixing them because it makes sense to them and they know this is a problem. Um, it can be that, especially for linters, it's often more code patterns and like someone that is maintaining a framework that wants this other framework to be used instead of the first one. So we, we can write those checks with linters. Uh, but that's not necessarily something that everybody knows that is important. So they may be less interested in fixing them. But still doesn't cost them very much because it's at this time, so they, they do fix it. Um, so these are the trade-offs. 
Uh, can they give feedback to, to you yes. directly in the interface? Uh, not directly in the interface. Uh, we have a group. We use um, Workplace, a lot of Facebook that is like Facebook, but for work, with many groups. And we have a, a feedback group for our team. And so there they can report when they have issues. So we haven't so far wanted to make it too easy for them to say this is a false positive because they may say it all the time and we may be overflowed, overflowed by thousands of developers asking for stuff. <laughs> but it, it works in general well. We get I don't know, three or four feedbacks a day and in general different people in the team are responsible for the different analysis and they can then look at it and fix false positives or explain why they can't fix it. Okay, so any more questions? Now you have the chance to really talk to reality here. <laughs> so, so this is uh, gonna, I'm, I'm gonna ask you to speculate, but can you imagine um, generalizing the kinds of checks that your tools supports to to ones that are not uh, to ones that are, for example, probabilistic, or, you know, based on machine learning, for example, uh, perhaps have higher false positive rates, but you know, would find uh, non-crashing bugs and and other kinds of bugs you can't currently detect. Um, so, in principle, there is no problem with doing something like that. Um, I don't think we have experts in that area at the moment. So, we also like hiring the people, and it depends like which which areas we want to extend into. For example, now we're doing performance analysis, like starting from scratch a new analysis for this. In general, we we have for putting an analysis in diff, we try to make it so that it's not too high false positive rate. But there is some other ways of developing. So I didn't mention, but there is another analysis that is like finding security bugs. And we have a different way of deploying this. There are like uh, expert engineers in security that generally look at code to try to find security vulnerabilities. And they look at code even by hand, by, by looking at it. And so just guiding them with some issues is quite useful, even if it has false positives. So there are, there are cases where this, this can be useful. OK. Getting to the end, uh, uh, one final question is, how much do you look to the research in this? I mean, are, are you like actively reading research, or is it more based on implementing what you already know, the type of analysis you know about? Or? Um, so I think different people in the, two, in the team are more involved with research than others. Like Peter O'Han is very involved still in research. And so he's developing with a group of people a threat safety analyzer. And they are writing a paper now, like actual academic paper. It's quite rigorous. They have a contractor that is a researcher that works with them and like looking at the theory. So there is a bit of both. Okay, thank you very much, Dalma. Big hands. Thank you.